Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. This episode sponsored by McDonald's. By the Big Mac. By the Big Mac. Specifically. Specifically. Well, we'll explain that a little later. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today uh, across the table from me uh, is Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. I think technically I'm adjacent to Adjacent to. Really across the table. Adjacent to on the table. But I'm here nonetheless. From me. Yeah, we got some. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to just ignore that entirely and just go yeah, into right what we're talking it. about yeah uh we got some excellent news st- i'm gonna read right off the show notes here we've got some excellent news stories and we're tackling some questions from the community as well including wow uh this could be more <laughs> boring could it simple smart glasses reveal the future of artificial vision uh this one's a fun one which we pulled right before the show user in your face is an online museum of design horrors uh, with little training, machine learning algorithms can uncover hidden scientific knowledge and watch a plane land itself truly autonomously for the first time. Uh, but first. But <laughs> first, all the banter. I, all I, the things that are I'm going like, on. You know what? I'm like half tempted to just read all of our show notes because half of this is done. You know, we prepare for these shows. We do. Yeah. And I, I don't want it to come off like we don't prepare. We have to automate some of it. We do automate a lot of it, and a lot of it's left over in there. Hey, you can find Absolutely. us every YouTube. Wait, no, hang on. Let me read these notes <laughs> verbatim. <laughs> but first, comma, first bullet, programming notes, second bullet, indent. Uh, find us on YouTube every Tuesday around noon Pacific. Uh, sub bullet of that, that youtube.com. Like in, in noon, or what's going on? What's that? Is it like in the ocean? In, in, noon? in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, yeah. Uh, sub bullet. Uh, youtube.com slash human factors cast uh, hey this is a sub bullet that we haven't deleted in a long time so excited to finally be able to say that and thank you to all those who listen and watch the show we love bringing you interesting content every week and your support means everything to us without you guys there wouldn't be a human factors cast and that's all true yeah it is we just leave it in there all the time though. we just leave it in there as a reminder to us that we should thank you every week because really the show is for you by you, by us, for you. By them. By them. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> it's a weird it's a weird Monday. I think we're both in a mood, Blake. <laughs> it's, it's that kind of Monday, <laughs> for sure. You know what though? It's, it's, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh so what's what's up in, in Blake's world? I say <laughs> <laughs> Just, I'm not gonna read that bullet. The, point. <laughs> the most effortless <laughs> segue into brief banter. As we have with Nick Rowe. Yeah. Nick's going to have some banter for you in a minute, yeah. but I'll start with mine. Oh, man. Okay. I'm not so, talking about that. Uh, he's, he's talking about it. God. Lots of shrubbery today. Uh, but so we've ta- I've talked like a hundred times over the past like five banters about my car, and today's not going to be any different. Whoa. You're just surprise everyone. <laughs> And talk about your car? <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah, Humble brag over here. Absolutely. Jeez. One more time. No, I just keep getting blown away by the amount of technology that's built into this thing. And this sadly took me, well, I guess not sadly, but it took me a while to notice this. But so do you use your in car navigation stuff that's built into like your system? Your you know what, Blake? I'm no? a peasant. I don't have a built in navigation. Don't? No. <laughs> Not in the, you don't have one in no. like the UI or whatever? No. Okay, so I don't either. I'm a peasant. <laughs> <laughs> I can't afford a car that has... What kind of money are you making? <laughs> uh, all of it. Uh, are you like pocketing all the podcast money that we're not making? That we're not making? <laughs> uh, the, ne- the negative money? <laughs> Oh, oh, we spent so much on the show. Right. Yes, yeah, just so it's so much on the show. <laughs> okay. Sure. Anyway, you have uh, you but have anyway, car navigation. Yeah, That's so what we're talking like about here. In car nav or whatever that runs just through my phone. So it's it's hooked up through CarPlay, which is okay. iOS's you know in car hook to your phone system that sure. has, lets you do whatever. And so I was using Google Maps the other day and not paying attention, have my music way too loud, and I was like, I'm not going to be able to hear the directions because the music's too loud. But I didn't really care. But anyway, so it actually cuts the music out of the driver's section of the car Whoa. when it wants when it needs to tell you an upcoming direction. And so I thought that was a really awesome another awesome instance because we've talked about sound design right. on the car a bunch of times or on the podcast a bunch of times. But I just thought that was an awesome one because like it, it literally like everybody else in the car, the music hardly affected at all. 
And, but for me, it like cuts out my little section completely. And all I hear is, you know, the Google voice telling That's me where I'm neat. going. It was really cool. Um, and it, it even, it even cuts down like some of the like mods that I've got on my sound system, right? That I have the bass really loud. And so right. all the booming comes completely out, even for passengers. Now, is it just like a subtle fade out or is it like a, a, a complete stop on, on, or a complete fade out? For on? me, it's a complete fade out. Like it. It, in your I don't section, e- I don't even know if it's like fading in or out, or if it just cuts it really low. It feels like it's fading it, fading it in, and then fading the music out and putting in like dropping the directions right. that I need. Uh, for like at least sitting in the car, it's not really that drastic of a change. It's still way too loud and way too metal. But right, but but I mean, you can still hear the music in the car because it's still playing in three fourth sections. Yeah, like four quadrants entire, of the car is still yeah. going. But the like what by one is just allocated to me listening to directions for the moment anyway. Um, so I thought that was a pretty sweet, you know, another feature that I found in the car. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to have you drive to lunch again so I can I can verify this. Yeah, it's just <laughs> fun. I like it. Yeah. But it, in like the one thing that I have noticed, though, is I think there's just such a still a bit of a disconnect between what I should be able to do through my like car play system being right. able to like, because it drives me nuts. I don't know if do you use like your in like Google I'm Maps too poor or for that, Blake. or anything? I use Google Maps. Yeah, so I got really used to using that in my old car, right? Like to go anywhere that I needed to go because I just don't really know where I am most of the time. And I am one of those people that I have Blake, to. Like you're know. in a podcast studio right here in Miramar. I'm not even sure that's true. Uh, no, it's absolutely it's true. I'm here with you. I don't believe no. that. <laughs> it's not real. Okay, continue. Sorry, um, you got used to Google Maps. Yeah, so I, I'm one of those people that always tries to get three steps ahead of whatever kind of turns I have to make, getting the sure. right lanes. And so I'll, like, swipe through the Google directions. Right. Well, like, even though I have a UI that's dedicated to to using my phone in the car, like, you can't project ahead and you can't interact with, the, with Google Maps the same way that you would mm. as, like, if you were just using your own phone. But it's obviously a safety precaution. Right. But at the same time, when it comes to... It's frustrating. You know, driving on the highway and stuff, it's Google... Uh, for me, at least, Google Maps is not caught up enough to be like be able to tell you exactly what lane you need to be in or when you're going to get off and what lane you need to be in when you get off, that kind of stuff. So it's, right. It'll tell you like the right two lanes, but not, I need to be in the left-right lane. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's not super specific. So it, it's kind of a funny trade-off between like keeping you safe as the driver in the car. Because, I mean, I think it's dangerous enough just to have the giant UI sitting in the middle of the car. Right. Um, and me like glancing down at that. But then, like, trying to make sure that you're not interacting with it as much while you're driving. Yeah. Um, but then you lose, like, the degrees of freedom of being able to, like, know, project where you're supposed to go and stuff like that. So privileged. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I got some stuff to talk about. So uh, uh, I mentioned on the show, uh, I'm going to be a dad here in a couple months. Um, what is that? Who are going to count down, like, three months, four months? Uh, we are at, what, it's, like, two? July? Uh, well, she's six months at as of uh yesterday so cool. three yeah, away yeah. yeah we get we got uh, we're getting there pretty close so um what's uh what we've been doing here is we actually we've been putting together our registry and um you know the the there's a million different websites that will offer to do registries for you uh but the one that we're using how do you pick one yeah how do you pick one do you pick amazon uh who has terrible labor practices and you know, they fire how, people with however you yeah, however you feel about them. Uh, you could do Walmart, however you feel about them and their politics. You could do Target, which is pretty much the only safe bet right now at this point, right? They're <laughs> the only safe people. <laughs> so anyway, my my point is, uh, there's a lot of different places to choose from, and um, how do you pick one? Because some items are available in some places, some are not in others, and uh, I feel like you know where I'm going with yep. this. Um, only because I can see the list. Only because you can see it right now. However, uh, yeah, there. So. I've talked about on the show how I like really enjoy this aspect of uh, sort of consolidating information from multiple sources uh, as it comes to like TV or health applications or anything like that. Really and, likes his aggregators. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you baby, baby, baby registries stuff? are no different here, Blake. So uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> you can take a look at my <laughs> registry and you can see like some of this stuff you can buy at multiple places. And what I think is really cool about this is that it actually lifts the price from those um, websites and actually integrates the price directly into this. So you can see like, hey, this baby wrap carrier is, uh, you know, $30 at Walmart and it's 45 everywhere else. So 
anyone who wants to buy us this thing can actually see it here and and they can see the price uh you know available um everywhere and they can they can make a choice based on price based on retailer uh, which is also really cool. Well, that's it's, interesting uh, that because yeah. the, the website's called Baby List, right? It's called Baby List. Yeah, I failed to mention that, but yeah, it's uh, it's called Baby List, and and uh, it's really neat because you can, like I said, see see things from everywhere, and um, and the the comparable prices, right? And and that's that's really cool. And I think one of the biggest things too is that there's this um, there's this capability like like uh. They allow you to add things from different websites, right? So, like, let's say, let's say I wanted an Amazon gift card. I already have it on there, um, but let's say I did, right? Uh, they, they have this bookmark available to where you just add it to to your list, and it's kind of like it just gives you this pop up and says it pulls what it can from the page, and you can like select some of the images and uh, make the title and what price you want and how many you want it. Uh, so it's it makes it fairly easy. Uh, to add things to it from other places. That's pretty cool. No matter where you go, right? It'll just pull in that information. Um, so yeah, it's 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 pretty neat. Yeah, it seems like it's nice and competitive from their point of view too, because they're actually listing their price and it's not always cheaper than everybody else. So right? That's, yeah, that's which awesome. which is uh, interesting to see, right? Because it's like normally you ha- you have some sort of investment. Um, and man, by the way, like just a quick aside, there's a lot of stuff that you need her baby and it's kind of overwhelming uh t- t- to the point where like i just i have no idea how i'm gonna do this <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i'm sure you'll get it handled what are some things you needed that you didn't really expect um that didn't come off I, the top of your head you know I I, I it's not any one thing it's just it's the, the sheer things. quantity of things that i'm just sure. like wow like e- you know, you know in your head it's going to be a lot of things, but then like when it actually happens, um, you know, it, it's like wow, I need everything, and uh, that's why people have showers is to enlist the help of everyone. Um, and I, I'm I'm really I'm really keen to talk to you about this one when I get back when it's time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the what, baby so, monitor. <laughs> yeah, dude, because this looks like it's integrating with your phone, obviously. Oh yeah, oh, getting all God. that baby health data. That's hilarious. Oh, you know it. I'm gonna start it like as a child and track watch my me, kid. Watch me progress. That'll be so cool. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a lot of He'll be nerding out on his child's data. Yeah, that? yeah, for sure. There's a lot of cool <laughs> stuff on here. Here he comes. Um. Anyway, yeah. Uh. That's that's uh. That's my two cents. That's all I wanted to share. Uh, for uh. For banter. Hmm. Yeah. No shrub talk. No shrub talk. We're going to skip the shrub talk and get right into Human Factors news. This is the part of the show where we talk everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be anything from, uh, what do we got? We got some aviation this week. Got aviation? Artificial vision? AV? Artificial vision? I, I just made up that. I don't know. Uh, anything. Good. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game for us, you and I here, Blake, to talk about tonight. It is fair game for us. Today. 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 What do we got at first? Oh my goodness! All right, so <laughs> simple smart glasses revealing revealing the future of artificial vision. So the sophisticated technology that empowers facial recognition in many modern smartphones some days could be could receive a high tech upgrade that is actually surprisingly a low tech solution. So University of Wisconsin Madison engineers have devised a method to create pieces of smart glass that can recognize images without requiring any sensors, circuits, or power sources. So researchers are using optics optics to condense the normal setup of cameras, sensors, and deep learning neural networks into a single piece of thin glass. So by embedding artificial intelligence inside of inert objects, this is a new concept and relatively seems like science fiction. However, it's pretty advanced and can open up new frontiers for low-power electronics. So the way this works is light passes through the smart glass is actually bent in a particular pattern, determining depending on the scene, image, or in this case, written numbers uh, facing on the glass. And if the light matches the expected pattern, the glass then actually recognizes what it sees. So right now, we use artificial intelligence to gobble up substantial computational resources and battery life every time you want to glance at your phone and unlock it with your face ID. But in the future, one piece of small, thin glass may be able to recognize your face without using any power at all. So leave it to both bringing together engineering and science to create something that's just seems way out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. So let me get this straight. So this, this piece of glass basically is, is uh, performing some type of 
object pattern recognition. Uh, and the application that they use is this face. Uh, and, and then you can do things with it. Is that kind of the gist of it? That's the gist of it. And okay. I think the biggest part here is they're talking about now we're able to remove, you know, having to drain so much power, having so much computational energy behind recognizing something like a face or handwritten numbers on just an inert object like a piece of glass. Yeah, that's cool. It's pretty nuts. I mean, you could have way different smartphone capabilities with that being the case, because if now we're able to divert a lot of, you know, either facial recognition or recognizing, you know, signatures or how you type on your phone, and we don't have to use any kind of actual battery power for that. Now you right. can have more computational power in your phone without having to, you know, suck up your battery just yeah. looking at your face. Yeah, this seems like passive... Um, passive... What's the word I'm looking for? It's like passive uh, facial recognition, but it's also passive AI in a sense. It's like... Kind of, yeah, because it's, it's just running it's off not, of things that's learned, but it's not using actual right. power to really do it anymore. Yeah, it's weird. It's like this weird accelerator for um, conveniences now that are powered by AI. And it's like, yeah, if you can allocate those resources that have um, previously been allocated for facial recognition you can do other things yeah i would assume this kind of changes the face of a lot of cameras and things like that too or potentially because they've already got glass embedded in them and for using you know cameras for surveillance or anything like that now you could be doing facial recognition with just small pieces of glass that way yeah uh you know um i do have to i'm going to give a shout out to one of the members of our slack community um this is, uh, I'm going to give out a shout out, shout out to Mateo. A shout out? A shout out to Mateo. Because we were talking about passive um, system processing. And Mateo has actually uh, gone out there and um, done this. Uh, he's supporting humanitarian scientific research by basically donating the processing power of his computer. And I thought this was really neat. And so anyone can do this. Um, if you just go to worldcommunitygrid.org, um, you can actually volunteer to donate your processing power to humanitarian research. Uh, and it, they just, you know, get on your computer and they start using your processing power to... to um, buy Bitcoin and things like that. To, well, no, uh, hopefully not. They, I mean, like, you know, at the very end here of this page, it actually says, you know, in the time that you've been learning about this, you could have, your computer could have uh, analyzed X amount of, of uh, pictures for cancer signatures. Um, and so like, not bad. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a cool thing. And, and this, this article kind of reminded me of that. So shout out to Mateo and shout out to any of you who go and donate your computer processing time to humanitarian research. Cause it's really cool to kind of see that. Anyway, that's a huge aside and, and only, you know, somewhat related to the story, but well, I feel like um, it's, if things like this get a little more like, cause you're basically putting in recognition signatures into thin glass. If we do that enough, you could maybe have the processing power of specific parts of your phone, whether it's unlocking it or recognizing your your face or whatever it may be. You could actually give enough computing power back that you could have your phone doing some of this for for agencies like this. Now, I don't know if it's enough computational power. Anything else, um, right? Like the, the less energy that we're using, we can put that towards other means. Yeah. And, so, I mean, the energy saving idea behind this kind of smarter glass or artificial vision is kind of an interesting concept in that you could be, you know, lending it to something like this, not just making your phone more powerful, making it more useful at a larger scale. Yeah. I'm, you know what? I meant to talk about this in banter too. I, I did. Uh -huh. But did. Uh, yeah, anyway, but that's a pretty cool one. What's the name of the organization again? It's uh, called worldcommunitygrid.org. Nice. Yeah. I'll have to so, give them some of my computing power. Yeah. You and me both. I think, I think we can report back on that next week. Yes. Okay. What do we have up next? I think this one's my favorite one of the week. Yes. This is Nick's by far favorite thing. You watched me fail at it epically earlier. So if you think that the design of Facebook, Twitter, or any other popular site that you see use regularly is bad, just hold those horses. So we're going to introduce you to a website that'll make you spill your coffee, pull out your hair, scream in agony, and maybe even punch the wall. And at the same time, the website aptly named User in Your Face is an epitome of bad design. Epitome. It, epitome, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. So the, the it's made by, I'm going to mess up their, this Belgian name, but it's Bagar based on the Internet of Things product agency to point out bad design practices and use as a marketing tool. 
So among the offenders are bat are bat boxes, forms, buttons, and pop-ups everywhere that'll do everything in the power to stop you from filling out this form in its entirety, which it does that with like flawless effort. Oh yeah. No, this is great. So I'm actually going to uh so I'm I'm re- I'm recording now so that way we can post it on our YouTube. But um so anyway, it's it's this uh it's this incredibly infuriating thing and I want to talk about the application first. So this is actually a great way for uh, you to understand the importance of human factors or design um, as it as it pertains to web interfaces. So yeah, I mean, this is just a masterclass of what not to do with a UI. Absolutely, yeah, that is the best way to put it. So I'm going to go ahead and and try my hardest to get through this, and I'm going to talk. I'm going to dictate, and maybe Blake, you can help me out here. So I'm looking at the start page here, and it says "user in your face," um, a bagger frustration. Uh, hi, and welcome to User In Your Face, a challenging exploration of user interactions and design patterns. To play this game, simply fill in the form as fast and accurate as possible. So you're then met with a big, gigantic, circular no button. That's the call to action button. And below, you have in black text, please click, underlined, here, all caps, to all caps, go to the next page, which is whited out. Uh, so it's violating a bunch of Maxim's design. I mean, from the contrast it's using to using a CTA and animation to draw your attention to something that doesn't do what you need it to do or is not the action you need. And right. then even its use of like standard icon or standard kind of practices with, you know, underlining for a hyperlink, that's not even in the, in the right place. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and click on here because I've done this before. I know what this is. Uh, And then I met with, this site uses cookies. Is that a problem for you? And in big, uh, bold red banner across the top, in white, it says yes with a call to action button. And then it says not really no as the other option. Which is funny because that's like totally the backwards of what we would see. That that would be considered a, a light pattern versus the dark pattern. Yeah. So over here in the bottom right corner, we have a how can we help? The little chat thing that you see everywhere. So you can type stuff in. Um, this is my favorite feature and then of the website. As you hit send, it says send to bottom. So if you say send to bottom, it slowly creeps down. Um, <laughs> it takes just, forever to leave. It does. Uh, in addition to all this, you have a timer at the top uh, with flashing carousel buttons one, two, three, four that don't actually do anything if you click on them. The timer is meant as kind of like a, a frustration tool. It knows you are freak you out. trying to do this in a certain time frame. And once it hits one minute, it says, hurry up, your time is ticking. Um, and the options always good to rush yeah. people through doing a process. Right? Options for this. This happens every minute on the minute. So you can either lock it. You can close it in the bottom left-hand corner here, which is also cleverly hidden with the copyright symbol. Uh, if you Where you would traditionally expect like a close icon in terms of an X to get out of the thing. It's actually a full screen icon. So you click on it and <laughs> it does the full screen. If you lock, you can lock this modal dialog so it just stays there. Um, anyway, I'm going to try to fill something out here. Uh, and you can see the password requirements are all in green at the bottom, meaning it's met it. If you click on something, it doesn't clear the form field. So, you know, you you, you can do like, um, I'm going to put in human factors cast as the password. Uh, and then you need 10 characters. You need one capital letter. You need one numeral. So we'll do one, two, three, four. Um, and then here's the fun part. You also need one letter of your email. And so we'll just do human factors cast at Gmail. Uh, uh, and the way that they have broken up the Gmail, uh, the, the, or sorry, show at human factors cast.com. How about that? Uh, show at human factors. Cause that's where we're at now. And um, so what's funny about this is that they've separated the domain and the email address by uh, the at symbol. It's always helpful. And then they've also specified the drop down for the uh, .com, .org, all that stuff. They have terms and conditions checked by default. That you do not accept. You do not accept them. Uh, and then the big call to action button on here is the cancel, right? And, <laughs> and apparently we want to go to the next page. You want to go to the next and in the place where you might expect next is reset. So oh. it's all designed to be frustrating. Uh, and then you have... Uh, Three minutes just to get to the second part of the form. I have been also describing a lot of it. But anyway, you have to... the Oh, my God. That just downloaded an it image? Did. Oh, it yeah, did. Oh, yeah, that's, that's helpful. Yeah. So you upload something. 
You also got, uh, you know, choose three interests. And I just want to call out special attention to this because I did it earlier. Unselect all is at the very end and select all is buried within it. So if you're, you know, trying to go through and just unselect everything, um, I did it manually the first time, but then you can pick three things. You do have to upload an image. Um, and then anyway, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you can see how that's uh, very frustrating to get through because it's like... Um, it's just a million different steps that you have to get through to get to just this form input that we're all used to. Yeah, I mean, it's built for, built for frustration, right? Just to yeah. like, prove the point of like bad design can end you up in some weird places. Uh, but it's it's pretty funny in terms of like how frustrating it can be. And like the, I don't know, I quit like on the first page or whatever because I wasn't going to read through the requirements for what the password needed to be. Yeah, so if, if you guys want to try this out, I highly recommend it. I, we did post it on the Slack, so if you want to go check it out there, uh, it's also userinyourface.com, and that's spelled N-Y-E-R, face. Userinyourface.com? Yeah. Let us know your favorite horror. Yes, let us know your favorite horror. There, uh, there are a bunch of different types of offenders <laughs> with that website, and it's just uh, an awful time. Uh, anyway, we got a couple more news stories, and we'll be back to break those down right after this break. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Point of clarification. Please. I don't know if it's clear. It's probably not. Uh, Is it Crystal? Anyone can join the Slack. We have an, a Patreon exclusive channel within the Slack. We do? Yes, we do. Yes. Why why did why were you surprised? You know this. <laughs> You've commented on it before. Because maybe people don't know it's in there. Okay, so you were trying to you were trying to feign... I was trying to subtly get okay. people to know, oh, there's a Patreon that's associated with this, not just a Slack, not no, just the okay, free stuff. You, know, you can get more? the free Slack. You can go to Slack. Uh, you can interact with all of us. However, some of the Patreons and us are having a secret conversation in a secret channel that only Patreon subscribers get. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. It's very active. That is all I'm saying. So if you want to join the Slack, anybody can do that. Absolutely. If you want to join the secret Slack... You can also that's do that, too. There's nobody that can't do that. That's true. You just have to buy our affection. Yes, buy, you have to buy our just, affection and we'll it just cut costs the lock off one dollar or more to get into that Slack. There and, you go. Uh, yeah, there's, there's sometimes um, some exclusive content is is how I will phrase that in that, <laughs> that channel. Some exclusive content, yeah, indeed. I, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, we... The real Fire uh, AF stuff is in there. Yeah. Like uh, that. Like, <laughs> like that. That's, oh, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's an inside joke for us. We're not. Uh, <laughs> oh, not <letting laughs> all right. Out. Yeah. So, yeah, you can join us there. Anyway, thank you to all of our friends over at Science Daily, TechCrunch, College of uh, Engineering University, Wisconsin, Madison website, and the next web for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or, like I said, come join us on our Slack for links to the original articles. Okay, Blake, we got two more up this week. What do we have up next? All right, so another one about computers. So computers can be used to play grand master level chess, but can they make scientific discoveries all on their own? So researchers, researchers yes. at the U.S. Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Berkeley Lab, have shown that an algorithm with no training materials in science can scan text of millions of papers and uncover new scientific knowledge. So a team at this Berkeley lab collected 3.3 million abstracts of published papers, published science papers, and fed them into their algorithm called word to vec and by analyzing relationships between the words, the algorithm was able to predict discoveries of new thermoelectric materials years in advance and suggest as to yet unknown materials as candidates for thermoelectric materials to be made from. 
So without actually telling the algorithm anything about the material science, the algorithm was able to learn concepts like the periodic table and crystal structure of of metals, and that hinted at the potential use of this kind of technique to discover new things. But probably the most interesting thing researchers figured out is you can use this algorithm to address gaps in mater materials research, things that people should study but haven't studied so far, whether it's time or money-based. Funding. But the paper, the paper does establish that text mining of scientific literature can uncover hidden knowledge and that pure text-based extraction can be an established basic basic Sci can establish basic scientific knowledge. It's okay there. Like, yeah, one words of these are days, hard. we'll finally have somebody else to read these stories. <laughs> you know, we'll have no an AI that just talks in your voice. And go, Blake, what do we got up first? Thank and we'll just read God. it. Um, so I, I want to touch on something here. So this, this is done... Data mining to the extreme. This is, and it's done with hard sciences, I think. This is, this is you know, it's... Yeah, the material sciences. But, I mean, if you abstract this, I, I don't think human subjects' research is far off. From this, right? If probably not. I mean, it could. It's not out of the realm of possibility for a system like like this one here with this machine learning algorithm to look at all the survey data that has been collected before, learn how to phrase questions effectively, and develop an online survey that it blasts out to target demographics. Like all that, I see as possible, um, and as well as generating rewards and and uh participation um trophies not trophies shut up uh it's <laughs> <laughs> participation uh incentives that's what i'm looking for so uh, i don't see it as that far off the the thing that it can't do that humans can do is like the face to face if you need to actually recruit people uh i mean it can still handle everything else it can handle the recruitment criteria it can handle the uh, participant uh, recruitment process and scheduling and all that stuff. And that would be interesting. And an entire uh, new sort of way for us to use this technology to help facilitate the research that we're conducting. Because, um, I mean, if you think about it, that's a lot of overhead that we're doing oh, yeah. now in, in research is, is a lot of the... Um, you know, the, the the upfront recruitment, the development of materials. But if you have a template, like if you're a researcher, you have a certain way that you perform research. And if this system can learn how you like to conduct your research, um, and maybe you tweak it after it comes through, right? And it learns. It says, oh, you, you wanted to alter it this way from last time. Got it. I'll do it this way next time, unless you say otherwise. That's an incredibly useful thing because then they've just generated your entire procedure and then if you pair this with something like we talked about last week where that integrated data uh, can show you results that you weren't even looking for, yeah. um, th there's some entirely, like, really powerful stuff here coming out with AI uh, that I can see being a useful addition to research. And that actually paves the way for us to spend more time in the conceptualization and... Um, conceptualization phase of these research papers like you can even probably feed an algorithm ways in which you write a paper and uh, i can see abuse happening right where people just throw just their stuff in papers out. crank them out yeah however um you know these papers are being peer-reviewed by others and so you know you develop algorithms to peer review the you know like i i still think peer review should be done by humans not Autonomous, For right? Because yeah, but I mean, like, how cool would that be to automate papers, right? Yeah, I mean, and you research, could automate, yeah. you know, statistical analysis from this kind of same model, or even just hypothesis generation. Because I mean, it was mentioning that there was things that could have been studied or looked at based off of some of the abstracts that it pulled together, but haven't been yet. So it could almost be used to keep you pushing in a new direction or provide you with a new line of research thinking. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm curious. I I just went on a like really big tangent here, or not tangent, but rant. Uh, what do you think of this? I mean, it's it sounds pretty cool. I would like to see it. See what happens if you kind of apply this to non-material sciences, and then what does it really come out with? Especially, you probably have to do it in some kind of, you know, s similar topic. Like you could do aviation human factors or something like that, and see what comes out of it for, you know, based off the abstracts that it pulls in. 
Right. I still think it'd be a really good tool just to generate new lines of research, especially if it's going through and just basically doing a real baseline scan of word to word. Here's what I see in abstracts. Mm-hmm. Um, if you take it a little bit deeper, I think there's a it's a it could almost automate the entirety of you know doing research from coming up with ideas to putting together you know projected statistical analyses that need to be done and then running them for you. Yeah, and even you know running extra analyses against it just to see if there's something else there. I yeah. mean, it's it's kind of funny we could make because in in the scientific community, data mining is a nasty word, but this could totally change with something like this. Oh yeah, I, I, it allows you just to view view research and science in a completely different way of like going down every avenue computationally to figure out what's going on in the world. Yeah, I agree. And and just to put it, bring it back to human factors again. Like another way that this could be useful is they could use this type of technology to auto generate A B tests for a website. Sure, a company could do A B tests and put it live and just see which one performed better. Um, and then refine it over time and keep the best design and pair that against something else and see what, you know, and just have this constantly running in the background to where the system is automatically running the results, figuring out which design is better and occasionally pulling in old designs, you know, and and it sticks with like 75% is the, you know, like there's, there's all these different parameters that you can say, but like 75% of the population sees the best design and then 25% of the population sees this new design. And if that new design outperforms the other design, then they might slowly switch over and see if the performance uh, stays constant with the other one or if you know more data results in worse performance. And they can just kind of slowly turn it back. And then slowly, just over time, an AI has generated all these interfaces and it's just slowly testing them over time. And with, with how much traffic, like with a, with a company like Amazon, um, Think about how much traffic they're getting, and if they change just micro things, you know. Uh, I mean, like think about just the on web the services yeah. alone, and the, the amount of data they've gotten across varied websites. Right. Like, who knows how many types of websites they're like they're hosting just through AWS? I mean, is yeah. Collecting that kind of data, you could really. I mean, you could definitely build really good UIs just from AI alone. It would take a little bit of like time with deep learning and stuff like that to try and figure right. out what makes the most sense. But I think the cool part about this anyway is the computational power behind it. it means you could almost do live changes and get depending on the type of traffic that you get you could get real-time response yeah like whether something's made a process easier has it, have you just made it more difficult okay can we pull it off and not have it live yeah it changes the entire even like development cycle right yeah it's it's kind of crazy to think about and i think we may have just no someone else has definitely come up with that idea right Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure Amazon has already <laughs> They're been already doing thinking this about it. We haven't even noticed. Oh it. man, well, you can see, send your royalties to uh, Human Factors Cast. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's cool, and I, I I'm excited. I I'm just excited about a lot of this technology to see the application. Um, quick sidebar: Have you heard of this game called Detroit Become Human? No, I haven't. Uh, you have PlayStation Plus, right? I do not. Oh shit! You need. It's free this month with PlayStation Plus. Oh um, no. But uh, in in like the hour that I've played, uh, it's it's about uh, twenty thirty eight or something, and androids have become a more commonplace uh, object in the home. Finally, and you know some of the some of the social commentary around is like androids took our jobs, and this this story kind of relates hard to that. So yeah, I mean um, this could in a lot of ways replace a a large amount of scientists' jobs, or it could augment it. It's it can go either way. Yeah, I see this more as an augmentation tool in the near term. Uh, with potentially, man, I just like, yeah, computers can do things so much faster than humans. They can, yeah. And it's like I just I want to see it. Oh, I want to see it. And call me a madman, I don't care. The speeds there. I mean, the worry about generalized, you know, AI that's so far off from happening. But stuff like this, where you can automate, you know, what takes sometimes forever to come right. up with brand new research questions or brand new, you know, surveys or whatever it is you want to use. Um, I don't know. You could really cut time down and maybe even save costs by using a, you know, basically just an algorithm. Yeah. All right. We got one more, one more news story. What do we have up last this week? All right. So a giant feat of German engineering. So German researchers have created an odd automatic landing system for small aircraft that lets them touch down not only with autopilot, but without any of the tech on the ground that lets other planes do it too. So it could open up a new era of autonomous flight and make ordinary landings safer. 
So researchers have created a system that can land a plane without relying on ground systems at all and demonstrated it with a pilot on board, or rather a passenger in this case, since he kept his hands in his lap the entire time. So a plane making, a plane making an autonomous landing needs to know exactly where the runway is, and naturally, but it can't only rely on GPS to do this because it ends up being too imprecise. And you can't use ILS or uh, another ground system, so what do you do? Well, the computer can find the runway the same way that pilots do, with its eyes, so back to computer vision. So in this case, both visible light and infrared cameras on the nose of the plane are used to help identify where an actual runway is. So this is a major milestone in automated flight, since until now, planes have only had to rely on extensive ground-based systems to perform, landing, perform landings like this one, which means that automated landings aren't currently possible at smaller airports or should something go wrong with the ILS. So this is pretty interesting that they've, they are kind of taking the tiered approach of let's try and fix the small plane problem and see if we can't get it to land by itself. And then maybe we can, you know, replace entire ground systems and just add infrared cameras and yeah. sensor systems on the front of a plane. Yeah. So the reason this works is because in infrared, you can almost see through clouds. Yep. Uh, so, you know, it's still able to process that picture when perhaps a human might not be able to. Um, and this is crazy to watch. Like this guy has his hands in his lap as the plane is landing. And it's just like, and it's, it's something that you just don't see, um, in human factors aviation. And this is going to go a long way, uh, for, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever see fully autonomous planes. Like we'll see autonomous cars. I would hope so. Um, but I think, passenger planes, I don't know. Yeah. Like that's, that's the question is like. Of course, I, we're kind of skirting nowadays what we're going to call a plane and what we're going to call a passenger plane. Because we've seen prototypes from, I think it's Uber. Right. It's got, like, flying cars, but that's technically not a plane. Right. Uh, but it, it's, you know, rumored to be autonomous at some point. Yeah. And, I mean, like, what I can see this being done for, like, shipping, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because then your your risk is super low, right? In terms of like human life or souls on board. I and mean, the, where you where you run to the problem is when it lands. Yeah, and I'd imagine you know once once these shipping flights have had a a certain number of successful runs, um, that's potentially when they would transfer over. And I mean, we see this on the on road right now, right? With um, some of these companies with the shipping trucks getting into the autonomous vehicle industry. Yeah, really changing up the game for how, you know, just shipping it all auto or vehicle wise is gonna go. Cause I mean, I'm assuming they can they'll translate it to ships as well at some point. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it'll just be everything all be, you know, nav by wires. But it it something like this with planes and I would assume with maybe not with autonomous vehicles, because we've seen a couple of prototypes that don't even have a cab. They're just you know, a giant right. trailer running, but like with boats and planes, I feel like you'd still have at least an operator in the loop, or it, or sitting like yeah, somebody monitoring on like some sure. kind of vigilance task. But I don't know. I mean, with the with advents like this, and you know, the potential for the like, capability to be able to fly without having a human intervene, I think it's only going to get the technology is only going to get more advanced as we go, and we'll stop seeing things like you know wings in the ocean. Yeah, I mean. I don't know. It's just cool. It's it's cool to see this uh this advance in in this automation technology. I think what's the most insane thing to me about this particular article is it's it's saying that we you don't need all the intensive signaling and ground stations anymore. Like just add a couple of extra add-ons to a plane that basically yeah. allow it to see and sense the way a pilot does, which is looking for a runway visually. Um, with the added benefit, of course, of you not having to worry about instrumentation. Um, and if you didn't have visual flight, you could just use the system to land for you. So it's yeah. like almost, it's an advanced technology, but also like an added safety feature for, you know, human flight as well. And can I just comment this, this landing looks really smooth. It looks smoother than some flights some I've been human. on. Like it, look, it looks smoother than some human yeah, landing. Absolutely. Like, so uh, there's, there's hope, I guess. Uh, anyway, you know what time it is, Blake? What time is it? It's time for... It came from... It came from. That's right. It came from Reddit. Oh my! This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics that can be today talking about. Here is Radio Nick, guys. Look out! 
<clears throat> you want to hear radio, Nick? Here we go. Let's switch gears and get to It Came From Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. Any subreddit is fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among the community. Yeehaw. Oh, my God. All right. Anyway, hi. We're, we're here. I'm, I'm not like that. That's not my radio voice. Uh, <laughs> okay, we got two. We got two. Which one do you want to get to first? I think we got time for both of them. Which one do you want to get to first here, Blake? Well, let's just go in order if we got time for both. Okay, let's go in order here. So this first one here is from uh, Elk and Nap. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Elk and Nap from the user experience subreddit. As a new grad, how to gain experience working with developers slash shipping real products? That's a great question. Blake, how do you gain experience working with developers and shipping real products? Is there any more to this? That was it. That was it. So the only... I've had this come up with when I'm teaching recently in a UX class, especially like I just did one course on like UI design, and the major question the student had was like, well, how do I actually get experience interacting with a real developer? Like we don't... Like currently I'm only working on physical products. I want to work on digital products, but don't have anything in my portfolio. What can I do? And so my recommendation to her was to actually go and go to meetups that were developer focused and go talk to web developers. Because a lot of times in my experience and a lot of the friend, my friends that I've worked with in the past, they are working on side projects. Like I, f I found my first freelance job through Reddit by asking somebody like, hey, kit, they said they needed help designing part of their UI. And I said, hey, let me help you. And that's how the conversation started and how I really learned how to work with a developer developing stuff for the web. And so it's the same same kind of thing you can do here. There's oftentimes a developer, like either through meetups or in your local area, that you can find maybe even through Reddit. And you can just work with... And the nice thing about development is you can work anywhere. You can work remotely with people. Yeah. And send designs back and forth and that kind of stuff. So if you're a new grad and you're looking to get experiment experience, I would check out... Reddit, like whether it's user experience subreddit, specific development environment subreddits, or go to meetups that are both UX or development focused and just talk to people. Yeah, there's always this kind of chicken and the egg problem, right? You need experience to get a job. You need a job to get experience. To get experience. Which is hard. It is hard. Especially uh, now because it seems like there's so many people that are super, they have so much experience in the market for UX designers or HF people. It's pretty competitive. Yeah. So you you almost like you have to hit the ground running somehow. So how do you even get started? Right. And and I mean it's a little late for this advice, but if you're not a new grad and are in school now, join a lab. That will get you a lot of hands-on experience and and potentially uh could put you in contact with some developers, right? Um like if you're uh if you're in school and you have a human factors and ergonomics society chapter, uh reach out to some local businesses that um, you could partner with. They love free labor, and uh, yes, they do. you know they can say that they collaborated with a school on this thing, and that looks really good for them too. And it looks really good for you if you've organized that. And then it looks even better once you say you've completed a project that you've delivered to them. Um, so that's one way to do it. If you're not a new grad, if you are a new grad and don't have the ties to the school anymore, um, you're put in a little bit tougher of a situation. Blake's ideas were really good. Uh, reach out to people um, on Reddit, on other community-based things uh, if you go to these developer meetups. Um, I would also recommend potentially trying to find freelance work on some of these other websites. Uh, there's there's a website, I think Fiverr, is that? Is that there's Fiverr. There's, uh, there's one that I used a while ago that WeWork bought, and I've renamed it. I'll put it in the show notes. The 99 Designs. I mean, 99 that's... Designs is another good one that you can try yeah. your hand at for sure. Um, there's a bunch of really good slacks in addition to Human Factors Cast Slack. Um, one's called Designer Hangout. That's right. a really good place to go, especially if you want to, if you're looking for freelance work and you want to kind of get your feet wet with talking to developers, you can find some front end people there. So that's another good resource. I'm sure there's discords out there too that are related to the same stuff. Yeah, the unfortunate uh, sort of reality of this is that a lot of these things will likely have to be done for free. <laughs> like, which there's nothing wrong with doing something I mean, for free especially when you're a brand new grad and you have and you need no experience, experience yeah. and you don't have a portfolio Th i mean that is just a downside that you know cya over here you know make sure that's 
a known reality. I mean, there are opportunities for you to get experience and get paid for it, um, like internships. But I mean, that's, I mean, that's another route you can go. It just, it just know that like it's going to be hard to get that that experience. Yeah, and if without. you're a new grad, like I would just go ahead and try to do work for free for people just to get your one get the experience that you need because it's going to be tougher than I think you think. And then two, if you're doing stuff for free and it turns out good and somebody uses it and that you know it could turn into a live website or an app, right? That's notoriety for you that all that probably can ultimately turn into contract jobs or whatever it may be one other thing that that's kind of a crazy idea just apply for jobs i mean like if you've gone through the training and you know sort of what you're supposed to do um then presumably if if a company chooses to hire you they are making that decision to say that you are the best person qualified for this job that we interviewed and so you should find some confidence in that and uh you know there's your experience right there. That might be that's kind of another good point to think about. If this is coming from the fact that you're seeing on, you know, job applications or whatever that you need to have experience working with developers and delivering real products and stuff like that, oftentimes what's happening is people that are writing these job descriptions are way oh, yeah. over selling what they actually need. And if they get you get the resume into the right place, like through the right algorithm nowadays or whatever, people will still it maybe have a conversation with you and you may even still get the job if you don't have all the experience they want. Right. We want C plus plus, Visual Basic, uh Flash, uh what is this, CSS, like HTML. Oh, I don't know. Like what are the language I don't know the languages. You need a master's yeah. degree. You need, you need ten seven PhDs. Ten years experience. You need like That's <laughs> the best one. You need a master's, ten years experience, you need how to code design and yeah. do human factors research oh. and be a UX master of some sort. Yeah, there's all sorts yeah. of weird all stuff. All the unicorn stuff. Ooh. Yeah. It gets tough out there, but just apply for jobs you think are interesting. Yeah. Do that. All right, we got time for one more. This is also from the user experience subreddit, and it's a wonderful follow up. Thank you, Blake, for picking these two because these right, kind this, of this is pretty interesting. This is this is a really great follow up here. So this one's by uh, user hexagram. We can read this one. Hexagram eighty seven. Um, yeah, developers ignoring the prototype. So as the title says, I'm a developer ignoring the screens designed in a prototype. Why would you do this? <laughs> oh, so bad. Uh, he's doing his own competitor analysis and then changing as he sees fit without consulting me first. That's the hilarious part is he's doing a competitive analysis on the fly whilst just to change all the stuff that, the, that I guess this designer is making. I don't know if they're even making stuff, but if they are, the thing that really sucks about this is you may not be able to do anything about it. That's the worst part. Because if you're sitting here with a developer, you've got a prototype in front of him, and he refu- him or her, or whatever it may be, and they refuse to even use it, there's not a whole lot you can do. And I'm assuming if you're in a company and there's upper management, you probably have to consult them at this point, or you're not effectively communicating with your developer, which there's, there's kind of two sides of that coin. But I don't know. Have you had experience with a developer just completely ignoring a prototype? Never. That sucks because I've definitely had that. No, I, I have. Had, of course, I, I have. A developer too, so I've I've ignored it myself. Look, here's what you do: uh, you take that developer's email, you sign it up for every all like the things porno website you can find, and just have them sign up for every newsletter using their their work email or whatever. There you go. And then they get a new developer that listens. And then that, <laughs> and then all your problems are solved. I'm gonna come into work tomorrow with a <laughs> yes. Yeah, just have like all. Thankfully, these. no one knows my work email. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but our 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 it's show at Human Factors Cast. Oh, geez. Anyway, that's what that's what you do. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you. I mean, look, it's a very precarious situation because they are not seeing value in what you're doing, and that is a very dangerous situation to be in because one. And first and foremost, the user is not going to get what they need. Um, now, Maybe, yeah. now the developer might come close, but that's your job is to find out what the user needs and to your expertise is the thing that's supposed to drive these designs. Um, so first and foremost, I would talk to them and say, hey, look, like I delivered these designs. I want to talk it through, right? And it's, it's a very diplomatic dance of like, hey, I just want to talk through these designs, make sure... You know, we're on the same page. Um, 
I noticed that when they were implemented, uh, they were a little different from what we suggested. I just want to talk it through and see kind of why those changes were made. Um, don't don't ever say that you're in the wrong or the person that did it is in the wrong. Just say, hey, these wound up differently from the way that we've sent them. And, and why is that? And let's have a meeting about it. Uh, it. If you can, right? there, It could be the situation where you're throwing it over the fence. That's a deeper systemic problem that might have to be changed by an organization, uh, organizational thing. Um, Word to the wise, if you're a freelancer and that's happening to you and upper management is not aware of it as you being a contractor, that it is not your designs that are getting through, you have to be very, very pointed and careful to make sure that you tell whoever you're working for, the development team is not taking your recommendations. Because yes. that, that can come back on you very hard. Yeah, and I mean, make sure to document your work. If you've sent it to them, be like, hey, look, this is what I sent. This is not, the, the current design is uh, not my design. It's, I mean, and that's very important, right? Because if, if it goes out for user testing and it's their design and, and it comes back bad and people point to you and say, well, you gave them this design. Yeah, but that's not what the design I sent them was. So just make a paper trail and like Blake said, talk to whoever your uh, client is. Um, or you know the the mediary between the two parties. I think yeah, it's it's a really sticky situation to be in. Um, and, and this one you can't tell from the question what if they're throwing it over the fence. It makes me hope they are because if it's not, then it's like there's just an obvious breakdown of communication between developer and designer. In which case, it could go either way. Like it could be that the designs aren't very well informed based off of you know what the software development environment is. It could be that like they the company or whatever they're working in doesn't really have a good you know process to find for when you're supposed what why you're supposed to use people's ux design or you know ux thought through designs versus when it's all right to have more creative freedom as a developer i mean it's it sounds like a pretty sticky problem and i hope that it i hope it's not like a continuing occurrence yeah hopefully not i'm trying to follow up on this thread to see if anyone else uh comment might give their their feedbacks yeah uh, I'm checking now. Hang on. So um, let's see here. Wow, there's 29 comments on this thing. So I'm not going to go through everything, but I'm going to read the top couple here. Uh, annoying. I think this happens because some don't understand UX and UI design. How much thought and reasoning um, that's been put down into the design? Solution is to maybe collaborate more closely with the developer if you can right from the start so that uh, this person can understand why the design looks and works the way it does. Um Yep, there's the manager comment that Blake made. Uh, there might be reasons that the developers are doing it and understand their motivation, kind of what I was saying. Uh, understand the prototypes and decisions taken in the way they were designed. Yeah, so, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that could be going on here. I think, ultimately, though, communication's key. Whether that's communication to management, communication to the prototyper or developer, um, that's that's all sort of you need you need to talk with everybody yeah because if you don't don't work in a bubble just like missing out on something completely that the, that the developer is seeing as a you know a challenge or a need and you're not meeting it yeah maybe like they can't like code the thing that you wanted to without like a massive rework and effort and if that's the case you need to be aware of that so that way you can get the most best of both worlds absolutely yeah it's a it's a sticky situation to be in and hopefully hopefully this person manages to find their way out um, get out of there, Hexagram87. Get out. Get out. Speaking of getting out, that's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Uh, you know, you can join us uh, for the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over social channels at Human Factors Podcast in the time that we are not here talking about Human Factors. Absolutely. Come join us. Uh, you can always send us an email, show at humanfactorscast.com. Those get preferential treatment in the It Came From Reddit section. So if you send us something, we will read it. Uh, we may not read it on the show if it's, you know, um, if it's so explicit, we can't read if it. If it's porno newsletters, we will not read yeah, it. Yeah, then we can't read it. Then we can't read it. Uh, if you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to find out your email so they can send you porno newsletters? If you want to find my email, you can find me in the Human Factors Cast Slack or across social media at Don't Panic UX. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing each and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Don't tweet porno at me. 
Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It, it depends. What do you think? At least one? At least five porns. <laughs>